This is the University Museum in Oxford. It's full of the most wonderful objects, skeletons, rocks and fossils, which tell us something about how we came to be. That's why I love this place. It's a spiritual home for me. If you'll let it, science offers the best answer to the deep questions of existence. Who am I? Where did I come from? What am I for? It will illuminate the world you live in and show you where you stand in the universe. We haven't long between the beginning and the end of our personal existence. Science offers us the privilege, before we die, of understanding why we were ever born in the first place. I look for understanding to the study of evolution, to Darwin's astonishingly powerful explanation for all of life. It satisfies my head and my heart. Others find their satisfaction in different areas, but wherever scientists are looking, they are all asking the same kind of question. I, as a boy, lived in Leicestershire, and in the, if you go to part of that Leicestershire, you can go into a quarry and you can find a stone, and if you knock that stone open, you see a seashell in the middle of it. And if you're a boy of reasonable curiosity, you say, how is there a stone with a seashell in the middle of it, in the middle of a rock? And you want to know why. Um, and that's how I became interested in natural sciences. Now, I may do a program about birds of paradise, uh, in which you are, your mind is blown because birds of paradise do such extraordinary, wonderful, amazing, beautiful, astonishing, unpredictable things. It becomes science if you then say, why do they do those things? Why do they do them as a family only in New Guinea? Why is a family only in New Guinea? And why is it that birds of paradise have males, only one out of a population will fertilize all the other females, and what are the consequences of that on the evolution of species? Then it becomes science. It is a question which anybody who is, starts off with that excitement about birds of paradise, wants to know the answer. Just as I did when I opened a rock and said, why is there a shell there? When we contemplate the colour, variety and complexity of the living world, it's easy to understand the satisfaction a scientist gets from studying it. Equally, when we regard space in its lonely majesty, we can appreciate why astronomers devote a lifetime to exploring the stars and where they came from. Astronomy certainly has me hooked. Uh, talking about the immensities of the universe, not just the distances, but the number of stars that there are, stars like our sun, the possibility that there are other stars like our sun with planets, some of which might be inhabitable, some of which might be inhabited, so the idea that maybe we're not alone in the universe. The concept that our sun will not be around forever, that uh, one day it will begin to die and the earth will become uninhabitable. So we are transient people here. We are not here permanently. We cannot be here permanently. We will have to climb into spaceships and go explore the universe and find another place to live. Science doesn't have to be big to be beautiful, or even beautiful to be rewarding. These tiny, apparently unprepossessing insects are a case in point. They're fruit flies, and they're full of secrets. Matthew Freeman has been studying fruit flies day in and day out since he graduated ten years ago. He'd be the first to admit it can be a slog. A lot of science is day-to-day -day grind and not at all exciting and sometimes when you get up on a Monday morning you think, oh God, I don't want to go into the lab again. But occasionally you get a little spark of insight into something which you know that no one has done before. Um, you understand some process, however small it is, in a way that you've been trying to battle to understand for a while and in a way that no one has done before. And I think that is really the key to the excitement. But in Dr. Freeman's case, the spark of insight was not so little. He's discovered something in fruit flies 
that may lead to a treatment for human cancer. And that started with finding a fly on my microscope that didn't have a normal eye. Instead of having a very smooth, regular pattern of the facets of the compound eye, it was very disrupted and rough, we called it. Um, and so immediately I was interested to try and understand why this fly's eye hadn't developed normally. So Dr. Freeman launched himself on the task of solving the problem. First, he had to breed a strain of fruit flies which had disrupted eyes. The next challenge was to find out which genes were causing the mutation. Then, when he and his team knew roughly what they were looking for, they analyzed the actual genetic code in a process rather like genetic fingerprinting. Three years later, they found the answer. The development of eye cells was controlled by a type of protein called a receptor. If this was overactive, it produced too many eye cells, giving the disrupted eye Dr. Freeman had seen under the microscope. It was a very exciting moment because, as I say, for two or three years, I had built up this idea that that might be what was going on. And so, when, at the moment when I really started to allow myself to believe it, was therefore tremendously exciting. Of course, the health of his fruit flies wasn't what was exciting Dr. Freeman. He takes the view that one cell works pretty much the same way as another in fruit flies, chimpanzees or humans. And indeed, the fruit fly receptor is present in all kinds of human cells too. Eureka! When that receptor is overactive in humans, that causes cancer. So having started with nothing but looking under my microscope at a fruit fly with a, with a disrupted eye, which doesn't have its normal, nice, smooth eye pattern, I've come up with this protein that may, in the future, be important um, in understanding and treating human cancer. Most of us couldn't do this. Probably wouldn't want to. 